Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon, wherever you find yourselves today. Yes, I'm still on my travels, so you don't hear my voice through the crisp microphone that you're usually accustomed to. However, that doesn't stop the conversation from not taking place. Now, we all know, regardless of where you find yourself in the world, the UK is going through turmoil. It is a very hard time. Now, many people are questioning whether this is a public policy issue, is it an economic issue, or is it now the start of the far right of the UK? But to help me make heads and tails of this, I'm joined by a senior member from the House of Lords, a former Labour Party member, and more importantly, I think he's a friend of a friend. It is Meghna Desai, Lord Desai, known by many. Lord Desai, it's lovely to have you on the platform this morning. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No, you're more than welcome. So, Lord Desai, I think the elephant in the room. What is happening in the United Kingdom? Well, uh, lots of things, but basically what you have to understand that since about 2008, so about 15 years, 15, 16 years, the economy has not been growing. I mean, very sluggish growth. We haven't had any productivity growth for, for 15, 16 years. And I think basically, and it's happening in some other European countries as well, we are impoverishing. We are not actually as rich as we used to be. But at the same time, people want to come to UK because they see a better life in UK. Also, remember, if you get into UK, you can learn English, and then you can go to America or Canada or Australia. So UK, UK is a very good place to get to. It's very easy to get to because you only have to cross the channel uh, in a boat. And so quite a lot of people pay a lot of money to uh, these uh, boat, boat people. Once they land in UK, they can claim asylum, claim their refugees, and to decide that they're not refugees takes about one year. So they have to be housed at that time. And the previous government, the conservative government, which is there for 15 years, they kept on saying, we are going to sort out the boat people, we are going to, we're going to transport them to Rwanda and so on. Anyway, the people kept on coming. And instead of doing something positive about that, uh, people kept on coming and these people kept on being very anti-immigrant. Now what's happened to the local people, local citizens, is that they find that their lives are not improving and these other guys are coming in, crowding out their schools and hospitals and things like that. You know, basically people don't like foreigners, especially if they're poor foreigners. And so uh, it started with Europe when when we joined Europe and we and Europe uh, became enlarged to Eastern Europe. There was the idea that anybody in Europe can go go anywhere in the rest of Europe. And to begin with, when we were only a small European Union, the French and the Portuguese or the uh, the Spaniards used to come. But then the Polish started coming, and then uh, Romanians and Bulgarians, the poorer Eastern Europeans. And the resentment of immigrants started. And so then we had this Brexit, the big Brexit movement. And it is a long story, but we finally succeeded Brexit. So those guys are not coming, but other guys are coming. Because, uh, because of climate change and all sorts of other possibilities. People think they come up to France and from France they get into a boat. And... Now, so I think one part of the resentment is of the local population, especially local population in what used to be industrialized areas. And all those industries have gone to Asia. They've gone to South Korea and Singapore and Taiwan, because when oil prices rose, wages were too high in Britain and in America. So all the industries went to South Korea and so on. So we are deindustrialized and we haven't succeeded in replacing it with something else. So 
people are feeling hard up, and these are mainly white people, white middle-aged people are feeling basically that they are not getting a good, uh, good deal from the government. Now, when the conservatives are in power, they could still go on hoping that these guys are going to fight and so on. Now, when Labour is in power, it's an enormous majority. And so the frustration is that Labour is not going to care about uh, regulating immigration because we are not against it. So basically, the, uh, as it were, the impatience is now boiled over. And uh, of course, it is racist in many ways. But it also, along with that, it is anti-Muslim. Some are Muslims are more visible, uh, or whatever it is, or people are more sensitive, Islamophobia, whatever it is. So we had, we have actually, you know, I've lived there for 60 years. I yeah. called that in 65. By about, about sort of beginning of the 21st century, England had become a genuinely multiracial uh, place, genuinely multiracial. We have Muslims, we have we have uh, Bangladesh, you know, we have Pakistanis, Bangladesh, uh, Turks, all that. Plus, we have Afro Caribbeans, we have Indians, so on. And there wasn't the feeling of being hard up. Yeah. Now we are feeling of hard up and this. So I think one way this kind of prejudice makes it uh, feel is that it's all the bloody foreigners who are here and taking away our jobs, taking away everything. And so to some extent, and of course, the Labour Party will fight it because the Labour Party is a genuinely multiracial party and we don't believe in the, uh, you know, exporting people and things like that. Now, unfortunately, it happened too early in the Labour Party's career. They just yeah. won the election and suddenly... It was almost the honeymoon was over before it began, wasn't it? Absolutely. I mean, it's a very short honeymoon. After a few days, suddenly it started. Parliament is no longer in session, which is no. why I'm right now in India. Uh, I, 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 well, I would be in the UK. But I'm, I'm not asking and, you questions. <laughs> exactly. So... In a sense, what it is, is, and of course, overall, the way Labour Party, whenever Labour Party has a majority, uh, they very, they get very conservative, uh, about to win, they get very conservative. They say, oh, we can't have, we have to have a balanced budget, we're not going to tax, you know, just to kind of to, to fight to the propaganda. So they have not promised any relief to the people who are right now hard up. I think they will give relief, but it is happening too soon. So I think what 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 will happen is if they can get this thing under control, and you know this it's a obviously somewhat organized, but these people have been around for a while. Uh, but I think it will take some time first to tackle uh, the riots then they'll have to have a serious strategy for what to do about the immigrants. See, my, my, I, I suggested in one of the debates that basically what they should do, but two, two, two bills ago, uh, I said, park a big boat in the channel, a big naval boat in the channel, and see to it that anybody going by, you get them arrested, is and is it is it too so late though, uh, Megan, for the optics? Because what you're saying, she's saying, is the British public, and not all the British public, but those who are underpinning these these riots or or protests, yeah. they need to part. They, the government needs to pass the public perception of a duty of care towards them. So showcase that they are going through the waters. Showcase that they are stopping or looking to stop illegal immigration. So at least that way, if the optics are there, people feel secure, safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think what they should do, they are not doing it so far. They haven't, they haven't even thought about it because they were very recently. Uh, I think 
uh, one way to do it would be to basically either provide the UK's own boats to pick up these people because you want to, if they want to come, they should come first of all safely and then you could process them. My suggestion was they should take them to another British island, not, you know, St. Helena or something like that and process them there. So it's almost like another Australia. Um, Megan. No, 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 no. St. Helena is very near. It, it's not like Rwanda. St. Helena is where we send Napoleon, remember? Uh, so it, it, it's, it's in the Mediterranean. It, it's, it's not very far away. Uh, but uh, I mean, I, I suggested that, but uh, don't anybody took it seriously. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think something like that, that you can park them somewhere, not on British soil, but on British sovereign territory. Yeah. To be able to process them. Process. Megan, is this an issue of failed public policy or is it an issue of severe economic crisis in the UK? No, you see, economic crisis is there, but basically, partly because of climate change, partly because of things, people are going to come from where they are to where they want to be. And I think a liberal left-wing government should actually say, we welcome people. Ultimately, we welcome people. And if it's a matter of building houses, building jobs, we will do that. Give us time and we will do that. That, that, would, be, that would be my, my uh, attitude. I mean, I've spoken on these bills in, in, in Parliament. And my, my idea always, there are no such thing as good refugees and bad refugees. Refugees are refugees. You have somebody arrives at your uh, doorstep, you have to do something about it. Now, and it brings over we are a very crowded island. We're not that crowded. It's all right. Uh, so it is a, a welcoming attitude and quick, uh, of a quick, as it were, uh, establishment of the status, uh, asylum seeker, whatever it is, is necessary. Now, that's the Home Office has got to be more efficient than it is and so on. Well, I think what we need to have is both reassure the immigrants and reassure the locals. The locals, we have to say, no, we are going to improve your life, we're going to improve the welfare state, we're going to improve jobs and so on, growth and so on. But we will not neglect our, our brethren who's coming from outside because they need us. Now, that may be too much, but I think that that will be ultimately have to be the Labour Party's uh, uh, response to migration, because you know this is this is a very small thing, but what we know from climate change is a lot of islands are going to sink in the sea, and those people living in those islands are going to have to go somewhere, and you know people just haven't thought about how big a problem this is. So we are just seeing a small part of the big problem. Now, you know, you can, we can negotiate with Italy and other countries and so on and so on. But there has to be a policy statement as to how the Labour government is going to deal with this problem. Positively or whatever. Is it a lack of will or is it a lack of know-how from the Labour government to get that done? Well, you know, they... I think A, they are surprised. It's a complete surprise yeah. that these riots are there. But I think, in a sense, uh, and they haven't really had time to, to think about that. Uh, they thought they had big problems of the budget, budget and so on. But this resentment, which is, see, we have had, uh, as you probably know, we have had uh, demonstrations about Palestine versus Israel. Those, those, those have been there. Uh, and they have been, as it were, although radical, those groups have not quarreled with each other. They haven't fought with each other. They may have argued, but they don't fight. These, these are politically, politically savvy people, mostly on the left. Now, the, the, the right-wing crowd, which is, which is rioting, is not, not that way left political. They're basically resentful. 
So, I, the key starmer is not enough for key starmer to say, I'm going to lock you all up, which is what he has said. He also has to say that, but we are going to provide things that you are worried about. And that is a very important thing. So I'm, I'm sure he will say that because he's, a, he's just been a, uh, been a prime minister for about a month. And uh, never before has any prime minister faced such a big crisis so yeah, soon. Early on. Like, uh, early on. So in a sense, they, 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 they'll have to pick it up. I mean, my, my view is that the majority in the country is well behaved. It's what the reports around the world are saying is that the UK is now becoming Islamophobic. And more so with these riots, it seems like it's anybody of color. Now that impacts people who are Hindu, Buddhist, Sikh, so on and so forth. Elephant in the room then, is the UK Islamophobic or is it just a fact of mismanagement, resentment? No, I think, you know, in a sense, we have people in the cabinet who are Muslims. There were people in the conservative cabinet who were Muslims. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so, in a sense, Muslims have been there. And, uh, the, but what I think it matters is that when the poorer white people are living next to poorer Muslim people, you know, it, it's a kind of it's a class thing as well as a race thing. Yeah. It's, it's a it's a crowded crowded neighborhoods in which people are jostling each other. Now. In a sense, uh, the government is going to build lots of houses and so on. They have said so. But nobody has actually focused on this particular problem. And I think they'll have to, in, in this month, they'll have to sit down and think of a problem, a policy uh, a response. That, yes, we understand what your resentment is, Islamophobic or not, your resentment is about the, the, the shortage of facilities and so on. And we are going to provide you these facilities. I think you have, yeah, you have to say you can't attack police, but at the same time, we know why you are doing it. Yeah. Therefore, we will do something for you. So it, is a, it, it can't just be locking people up. You have to do more than just lock people up. Yeah, absolutely. Because you, the, you, you're you not hitting to what the root cause is. You yeah. mentioned a few times yeah. about issues such as climate change, because we know it is, on a global scale, a genuine phenomenon. Yeah, exactly. We're seeing it here. Yeah. And so what we're seeing now is the tip of the iceberg, because as more people are tending to move because of fear and safety and absolutely. resources, absolutely. we're going to have more... Do you foresee then more demonstrations and more violence in the streets where yeah. refugees are coming through because of a range of issues? Yeah. You see, if you, if you, if you look at what's happening across the Mediterranean, lots of people from Africa going into Italy and, and France and Portugal and so on. And they, they have this problem because the, the, the Mediterranean is a fairly small, small distance for people to, to, to cross. Now, I think we have had all these climate change conferences and so on, but nobody has seriously tackled this issue of what you're going to do about, you know, you know, people who can't go on living where they are living because climate change will make it impossible for them to live. Now, that problem, I, I have sort of talked about it in some debates, but that problem has not really been uh, at, at the top of anybody's agenda. My own solution is, is okay, it's very peculiar. You know, in Central Asia, there are large lands with sparse populations. Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Mongolia, here. Somehow, there has been international agreement to give these countries lots of money to settle these, these refugees. I mean, they'll have to be bribed to do that because who well, the hell that, wants? That, But that's the point, though, isn't it? It's This is about the movement of people. It is about bigger issues, climate issues, exactly. does create scarcity. But then there's also this cultural phenomenon that people often Absolutely. overlook. Absolutely. 
And so it comes down to the ideas of national identity, which is always a very politicalized yeah. weapon. I mean, I mean, think about the Palestine. Uh, the Palestine refugees who have been growing for a long time now, for about 50 years, they live in Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, whatever it is. Plus the new refugees which have been created. So where are they going to go? We're not going to have a two-state solution. Somebody will have to find a way of where you're going to take all these Palestinians. Obviously, Palestinians want to be in Palestine. But if they can't be in Palestine, where the hell are you going to put them? Yeah. Find a Muslim country and take them there. What's your biggest frustration? Because obviously, you've been an active member in politics. You're an economist. And more importantly, you're a common censist. In a world yeah. where common sense should be common, it's everything but. What's yeah. your biggest frustration then when you look at the globe as it is right now, when we're talking about foreign policy, when we have a look at economics and we look at society? Yeah, yeah. My, my biggest frustration is that, you know, I have lived with climate change conferences now for 50 years. Yeah. In 1971 or 72, there was a conference in Stockholm. And the people were saying, one week to save the world. I mean, that was 50 years ago. We have climate conferences, but each country has its national sovereignty. They won't blame somebody else. Yeah. Oh, either the, you know, it's your fault, you, you guys polluted, the, give us some money and so on. Like for India and China uh, at Glasgow uh, uh, so COP, uh, they said, we want to go on burning coal. Now, who could say no to India and China together? Yeah. Now, obviously, burning coal is not a good idea. But if India and China want to burn coal, who the hell is going to tell them not to burn coal? So yeah. again, again, and again, you know, there are all these oil countries hosting climate change consumption. But they're part of the problem. Now, uh, prop, so, so the world does face uh, this thing. That everybody prices. talks about it, but nobody does anything about climate change. Seriously. Now, okay, I'm 84, and I'm not going to be there when it all heats up. But I think we, want, we ought to think about uh, displacement of people properly. Because, uh, you know, you know I, I've been in Delhi, well, I was in Delhi uh, during the summer. Uh, it's really hot. Delhi is really, really, really hot now. Yeah. And it's hotter than normally is because, uh, you know, of course, the air is polluted, but, but it's really hot. So the heat wave has now finally come to India. <clears throat> now, it's happening in California, it's happening. So I think I'm frustrated that on a matter of language, the seriousness with which people ought to take climate change, they have not taken it. You know, there are people demonstrating about stop oil and all that. But demonstrating are over the statesmen, statesmen and people in power have to be able to take it seriously. And I think by and large, my, my frustration is that nobody's taking it seriously at all. And there isn't really, yes, we have got scientific evidence from the UN this or that thing, uh, but we haven't really got a uh, global sort of urgent urgency that this has got to be tackled because this is our people and their children and grandchildren. Yeah. And I think it's going to be very serious. We know it's going to be serious. And what we're uh, going to see is, and your prediction based on sound understanding is exactly. in a world where scarcity will then start to continue coming in yeah. we will see more yeah. war and more displacement and what we're seeing here with protests will yeah. even heighten yeah you see that the science is there the yeah. science is undeniable we even know roughly what is needed to solve it what is lacking is a kind of agreement of countries to give up a bit of the national sovereignty and cooperate and make a make us a fruitful job of it, because uh, in a sense, the rich countries are already crowded. Yeah, and they're not going to take any more people. 
and so we have to, we have to do something to relocate uh, and sort of rehouse these people. Who, if if we to, don't fix it, and we haven't fixed in the last fifty odd years. And we've all spoken at the Commonwealth Secretariat about climate change. We've all taken on discuss discussions globally. If we don't fix this, what do you think is going to be the final result? Well, I think the world will not fix it until there's a very serious crisis. A really, really serious crisis. And that's when there will be serious loss of life. And that's when people will wake up. I'm sorry yeah. to say that, but uh, uh, it is a, uh, there is not even a blueprint right now. And I, I worry about these people in these islands. I have got a list of uh, islands which are going to sink uh, when, when the sea level rises. Uh, and what are those people going, where are those people going to go? Uh, and uh, we just haven't got a global perspective on that. The UN should be doing it or somebody should be doing it, but uh, it's all going on into, you know, me, me, you, you, sort of, it's a, some kind of a, a little, little battles. And mm -hmm. uh, nobody take, you know, because everybody says, oh, you know, but by, you know, 2100 or, 2090, whatever it is, it's, it's too far away. It's too far. It's, it's a typical political gesturing whereby you make promises in exactly. the future where, yeah. where you know yourself will not be living in. Absolutely. Hey, um, you know, but also, uh, it's very interesting. I I read somewhere that uh, people started calling it not global warming, but climate change, because it's a more easy word. Global yeah. warming actually is more more threatening. So, so don't call it global warming, call it climate change. And yeah. so it is a, uh, that that's a way of uh, Lob calming is, down, calming yeah, down your work. Is, is the, the lobbyists at work, and, and, aren't they? And, and, but I, I think the problem is not going to go away. The problem is no. a very major problem. Megan, in, in your own mind, you've obviously seen the work that the Global Indian Network does. It's bringing conversations around the globe together in a meaningful capacity. Yeah. In your own mind, why is the platform important, especially now when we're more interconnected than ever before? Well, you know, I think in a sense, uh, generally speaking, the world is not as well off as it used to be. Yeah. Okay, I mean, in, in general, uh, when I look at uh, at Europe and America and so on, the, the local feeling in America is, oh, they got problems. You know, right now the Trump, the Trump and Harris sort of thing. One of the things that Trump is playing on is, oh, we are hard up. Yeah, we are hard. You know, Americans are hard up. There's too much inflation. The uh, jobs are not there. Now, if it were the richest country in the world is complaining about being hard up, you, you, you can see that, in a sense, the optimism that there was there, say, yes. even in the 1990s, 1990, there was globalization and optimism and all that. That optimism is gone. Yeah. We are, we are, we are, we are landed in the local wars, Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, and so on. But in a sense, the optimism is gone. I have lived to the optimistic days, and I can see now that that optimism is gone. Yeah, now, and, that, and that has a big impact because it's the way that people feel about a nation and its growth story, but also saying, where can we start to produce and be more creative? Exactly. And, and everybody wants to, you know, save, uh, save my, my own little neighborhood and the rest can go to hell. Yeah. So, in a sense, to, no, it may be that this is just a phase we are going through and maybe it will all get better, uh, you know. But right now, I don't see any uh, statesmanship. Yeah, globally. And 
Come, coming to our platform, the Global Indian Network, obviously it's about enhancing yeah. conversations around yeah. the world. In your own mind, the work that we do as a Global Indian Network, why is it important? Why is it? Why is it important, the work that we do as well, a Global well, Indian well, Network? Well, I think it is a, it's very important. It is that each country should have its own thing and a global uh, messaging system. Yeah. Because we all ultimately, unless we tell each other what our problems are, and our problems are global problems. Our problems yeah. are not just uh, uh, local problems. And I think somehow we need to convince people that what's happening to us is really part of the, uh, the global, global story. Yeah. I mean, for example, a billion people in India, million people in India, if they suffer, there's going to be a big problem for the world. Uh, yeah. you know. and, and so, I mean, in a sense, India has, uh, as it were, not yet on the edge of a climate change problem, and we may be able to use a solar, solar energy and things like that. And I, I like think, it. And I like the idea that it's telling is having a shape of the global narrative. Megan, I've I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation because we've taken on the big beast of the West, which is what's currently taking place in the UK. We're breaking it down, saying actually there are larger variables such as immigration, yeah. such as climate change issues. And now we're at the final stage of saying actually we do need to have a global discourse on why we see massive amounts of people yeah. movement. Yeah. Yeah, so we have all the means of communication. Yeah. Let's yeah. use them. Absolutely. Megan, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I enjoyed talking. Thank you very much. Take care. Global Indian Network. Print, TV, events, podcasts. Find out more at globalindianseries.com.